Sounds like we're ready to fight. That's good. Very good. Amen. It is good to be here again in the house of God with everyone here. Wow. Beautiful song. Uh, beautiful worship. Uh, we've been talking about spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is when the enemy, the devil, opposes God's plans, purposes, and his people trying to thwart the goal that God has to redeem mankind, to reconcile mankind, even Scrooges, even Scrooges, right? And he, God redeems, and he reconciles and restores, and, and Satan wants nothing to do with that. He doesn't want us to do that. He doesn't want that to happen. We're learning that spiritual warfare is, we're not ghostbusters. You know, we're not, we're not seeking out evil spirits and trying to slay them. What we do is we advance the gospel by loving everyone with the love of Jesus Christ. And what happens is, is when we do that, the enemy will stand against you and it will cause issues or disruption. And so we're learning how to handle those things. And last week we learned that we stand in the armor of God. That we have Jesus clothed over us. He lives in us and we are more powerful than any scheme or stand against the enemy. Because we are clothed in Jesus Christ. Everything about the armor was Jesus, and everything was made by God, given to us by God. So we're putting on the armor of God. We're not fighting the enemy on our own. We are fighting with weapons from God. And this week, maybe you went under some attacks, or maybe you didn't because the armor of God was working too. In a way where you didn't even see it because the Lord was fighting a battle for you. You didn't even have to recognize it. And then sometimes we have to open our eyes. Sometimes we feel the intensity of the attack and we operate in the Holy Spirit. We operate in the armor. It happened to me and my family this week. We weren't looking for it. It came to us. And it's interesting. The lies and the false accusations that came against my family. But you know what's really amazing? Is that if we live the way God called us to live, live a life of integrity, we don't have to defend ourselves. The enemy has to go against God. Amen. The Bible says, let your righteousness shine like the noonday sun. Trust God to take care of it. In other words, you go ahead and do you, follow Jesus, and let him fight those false accusations or those smears about your family. And you know what? If we live a right life, righteousness will shine above all the false accusations. So church, I'm here to start. I came out swinging again, didn't I? Came out swinging again. You have to be able to recognize those things. And you know what God told me month, over a month ago? Let me fight for you. I'm the general. I'm the commander. You stay behind me. I go before you. You follow me. I don't follow you, Ryan. God was clear on that. So when I move, you move. When I advance, you advance. And if you are supposed to speak up, you will speak up. And right now, God is saying, just stay quiet. Let my integrity, God's integrity, his righteousness defend me. And also, the ch listen, though, church, it is important that we live a life of integrity so that nothing can be used against us. How many know that if we don't live a life of integrity, we're making the enemy's job that much easier? Because when we make mistakes, he uses those against us, right? But what's beautiful about God is his grace is greater than those mistakes. And he will forgive you and restore you. And I'm jumping ahead. My goodness, I need to stop. Yeah. All right, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. We're going to talk about spiritual weapons. And you may be surprised today by the weapons I bring up. They're unlikely weapons we may never really consider. We usually think about the word of God, the sword of the spirit. We think about prayer. But God was showing me in scripture in the past couple weeks different weapons, weapons we would never think of. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And that's strongholds set up by the enemy, like false accusations, attacking integrity, things like that. So what are these weapons? Well, in my study, cross-reference took me directly to 2 Corinthians 6, 3 through 7. And in fact, what's interesting is 
Paul was having to tell the church about his integrity and remind them how he lived among them because he was facing opposition with false teachers, false accusations, division, and lies. And so he actually brings up spiritual weapons that he's using in one, in one hand to, to be on offense and in one hand on defense. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 6, verse 3. He says, we live in such a way, he's talking about he and his coworkers, those who travel with him to preach and minister. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. And no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. Church, he just labeled, he just gave us spiritual weapons. We proved ourselves, in other words, with righteousness or integrity, our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. Love is a weapon. And then he goes on to give more. We faithfully preach the truth, which would be the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. What does he mean by that? Well, we use the spiritual weapon to attack like love to change our community. But then when we get a false accusation or a lie or something that comes against us, we use our integrity to combat and defend ourselves, right? Now, we don't have to do it. God does it for us. And when the enemy comes and starts challenging our righteousness, we just have to say, I have the breastplate of righteousness. I have Jesus Christ. He won the victory for me. It wasn't my righteousness that won. However, though, we do play a role in righteousness in this sense. After Jesus made us right through his life, we should conduct ourselves in right living. Why? Because words are cheap. The actions speak louder than words. And, and, and actions and good deeds are a good defense against the enemy. No matter what people say, they're going to be like, oh, that's not, that's not that person. I know them. I've seen them do all this and this and this. That's not that person. Listen, when slander and gossip comes to your ears, the first thing to do is ignore a slanderer or a gossiper. And then if they're attacking someone else's integrity... That's a grave sin. That is lethal. That is, that is, the enemy is behind all of that. So we take those things captive and make them obedient to Christ. We demolish strongholds, Paul is saying, with the way we live. So what's interesting is, is integrity and righteousness also includes the weapons I want to refer to today. And the first one is the weapon of humility. The weapon of humility. And again, you may not have thought about that today. I did promise last week I would talk about humility because it was at the end of my message. I didn't get to it. And I, I, we really need to bring it up because humility is really a weapon because it's righteous and it's integrity. You know, the devil is hoping that we will have hearts filled with pride because he can use pride to jack everything up. The problem with pride is it makes us weak against the devil and we don't even notice it. Pride causes us to overlook our weaknesses. Instead of working on our weaknesses, we overlook them and go, I'll be all right. Pride develops an unteachable spirit. Pride neglects personal growth. Pride lives in denial. It develops a dependency on oneself. It chooses not to rely on God every day because I got some of God two days ago at church, so I'm good. That's exactly what the devil wants you to think. You don't need God every day is what he wants you to think. Pride, therefore, causes arrogance. The pride that we can think we can be around sin and win against temptation, that ignores common sense. The pride that we think we can be around things that are going to tempt us and we're going to be okay, we should never do that. 
we should refrain from those things. Did I preface my message with how heavy this was? Did I, did I do that? Did I, just, did I give a disclaimer? I forgot to do that. By the way, I'm going to be really honest today because I'm attacking the enemy today and what he's trying to do to the church. Amen? Amen. Again, I'm not, a, I'm not coming at you. I'm coming at the works of sin and the enemy. Okay, we need to recognize that today. Now, we have to own up for things. We have to address those things. And, and we never preach this way to beat people up. The word of God does this first. You know, when I read the Bible, it doesn't take long to come across some corrective living teaching in the Bible. I mean, in every letter, Paul corrects the church. In every letter. And so, you know, as you read, you'll see that God is trying to teach us and teach you something. And so don't be afraid of the honest word of God. Amen? Amen. It's exactly what the, the enemy doesn't want you to know. So let's go to James 4. James 4. We're going to look at verse 7. This context is, is that James is talking to the church, and uh, he, he's actually saying you are committing spiritual adultery. Your, your friendship with the world is making you an enemy to God, and you need to humble yourself and, and come back to God. And he says, God opposes the proud, but lifts up the humble, but gives grace to the humble. Now, let me, let me tell you something. There is nothing more scary than having God oppose you. You know how we usually say that God, if God is for me, who can be against me? That if is really important. <laughs> because here's the, here's the reality. God is not for us when we're constantly living in sin or cheating on him with the world. So we cannot walk around and say, but God is for me. God is for me. He is going to oppose you if you live in habitual constant sin but he's going to oppose you to keep you from going to hell, to hopefully humble you and to teach you to come back to him and to humble yourself. And, he, and James even says in, in verse 4, come close to God and he will come close to you. But what's happening is, is in James 4, we're learning that the devil's behind it and that the devil's having a heyday on the church. If he can get us to do all these wrong things, he's having a heyday. And, and so James is like, this is how you do it. Humble yourselves before God. This is how you get out of it. This is how you get out of that mess, how you get out of that sin. Humble yourself before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He's, he's showing us right there that the devil is behind a lot of that work. And in the NIV version, it says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know what we do? We'll try to fight those things in our lives without God. I got this. I can do this. I'll use my power, my energy. I'll, I'll use something. And we have to submit first under God. Here's why. If we submit under God, if we confess to God that we have been going the wrong way, if we humble ourselves and say, God, I can't do this. I can't, I can't get over these things. I'm sorry. I need your help. Do you know what happens? God comes and he lifts you up. And he protects you with his armor once again. He is there for you. And now the devil is looking at God, not you. And now he has to flee. Did you hear that? What happens is when we come under God, when we are clothed under God's armor, we acknowledge that we need to be under his authority and his help. The devil no longer just sees you. He sees God. And that's why he has to flee. Because he can't stand and be successful against God. So church, God's actually saying in this scripture through James, I love you. Humble yourself. Come back to me. Submit to me. Let me help you fight. We're going to win. We're going to win. You are forgiven. You are loved. Let me restore you. Isn't that beautiful? All because we saw where we needed to submit. Because the devil is behind a lot of the pride. The devil's behind all of that, and he's trying to work on us, and he's trying to have his way in us. So let's let the devil face God when we ask God for his help in those situations. Why is humility a weapon then? 
because the humble rely on God's power. The humble don't rely on their own. They rely on God's power. God uses humble vessels. God doesn't oppose humble people. He lifts them up. God uses humble people. And the enemy knows that, that God can use anyone who humbles themselves and lets God work on them. The humble know their flaws and let God work on them. See, here's the thing. Do you know who else knows your flaws? And when we ignore them or we live in denial because of pride and we have blind spots about them, the devil's happy about that. But if we let God work on those things and we humble ourselves and we work on those areas, now he's losing ground. Do you hear me on that? Do you see how we play a role in spiritual warfare? That we don't get to, I, I, know, that, I know scripture says the Lord fights our battles. That's in the Old Testament. That's true. But we can be our own worst enemy as well. If we let Satan have a heyday. The Lord fights our battles when we submit to him and live the way he asks us to live. The Lord fights our battles. That's true. But we must submit. That's a, we have to understand that teaching in its full context of the whole word of God, not just one Old Testament passage. So we humble ourselves. And here's the crazy thing. The reason why the devil can't stand humility is because humility is transparency. And guess who hides in the darkness and the secrets and masquerades? But if we're transparent, the devil can't compete against that. Oh, man. Let me tell you something. Church, I had a brother in Christ confess a sin to me. That was the last thing the devil wanted him to do. We prayed together, we restored him, we came up with a battle plan on how to resist next time. And guess what? He was set free from that guilt and shame. Amen. Exactly what the devil doesn't want. And he's telling that to the lead pastor of Calvary Church. And I didn't beat him across the head and say, get out of my church, you know, yada, yada, yada. Don't be afraid. Because... It's in transparency where God begins to work, in confession where God begins to restore and fix. That's, I'm willing to fight like that. You know what I mean? Because the devil works in darkness, in secrecy, in hiding because of shame, because of our shame, and we don't want anyone to know. And that's exactly what he wants you to think. Am I touching some buttons today? Now, I don't have, I don't have time for uh, 600 people in my office this week, but, <laughs> but we do have the body of Christ that go to each other, as the word says. And we need to restore each other and love each other and work with each other. God wants humble people who can admit their flaws, and he will do damage against the kingdom of God when we are humble. I'm sorry, against the kingdom of, of evil and darkness. When we are humble, he will use us to change this world. So what's going to happen is, is when we mess up, it takes us out of the fight, doesn't it, for like a season. It makes us feel bad. It makes us feel ashamed. And so the devil doesn't want you to get restored by the church or the leadership or our brother and sister in Christ. The devil doesn't want you to fix anything you did wrong because then you get back in the fight. But we're ready to get you back in the fight. But we have to come with humility. And that's what James is saying here. Wow. Wow. That's why humility is a weapon. And then there's another one, and I really won't do justice on this, but the weapon of unity. The weapon of unity. Unlikely weapon, you might be thinking. But he, the devil, the enemy, is aware that we are exponentially powerful in advancing the gospel when we're all in one accord and in unity. He is scared of a church that works together and loves each other. And man, just th what you heard today is a testimony of God about all the things we're doing. That's God first. And then that's the church. That's a compliment to the church that we're working together. So let's give God all the glory first. Right? Amen. The, the teamwork with the, with the state and all that, the partnerships we have are so important. And they're helping us change this community. John 13, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So how does, how does the devil work uh, 
to incite conflict and division and discord. Believe it or not, church, once again, we have to look at ourselves. He will use people. James chapter 3. We'll go to verse uh, 13. James 3, 13. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life. There's that integrity and righteousness. Doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such, wow, ready for this? So jealousy and selfishness are not from God. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, or worldly, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Wow. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Amen. So at the core of conflict and division is earthly, worldly, sinful things, and even the, the influence of the devil. And we need to understand that it's him that's causing us as well to stir up jealousy and selfishness and to cause disunity and division in the church. And that has no place in the church. Now are we wait. That has no place in this church. We're going to go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. You got to hear this scripture. The work that Jesus did on the cross for us to bring us all together in unity. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we are one family. And, and what Paul was doing here is Paul, Paul was a, an apostle to the Gentiles, which is anyone who's not a Jew. And it was his job to bring this message of reconciliation, to talk about how Gentiles have been included into God's people if they believe. So bringing everyone together, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew now, it could be anyone that believes in Jesus Christ is now part of the family of God. And this is, this is important that we read this because it gives us a foundation fundamentally and theologically of unity. It says in verse 11, chapter uh, 2, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, 11, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. Wow, that's strong words. Who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ, you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near or included to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with, the, with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility, our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Before I finish, I just need you to understand that for the Jews, in order to be right with God, they had to obey every law. Okay, they had to, they had to follow the regulations. Well, that was impossible for Gentiles because they weren't Jews. And so that system was over through Jesus Christ. And so all it took now is whoever believes in Jesus can be part of fam the family of God. They didn't, the Gentiles didn't have to follow all the laws of the Old Testament, uh, um, all this, the ceremonial laws, all the different laws that weren't the moral law, like the Ten Commandments and things. All that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so the only thing that the Gentiles had to do now is they didn't have to be circumcised. They just needed to believe in Jesus. But the Jews were saying, no, you have to go through all these things in order to be saved. And Paul was saying, that is not the case. 
So it goes on to verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord or the church. Through him, you Gentiles are also becoming, are being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. What we're reading here is, is that Jesus included all people by faith. So if they believe, they're included in the family of God. Multiple times, something jumped out on the pa- off the pages when I was reading this. The amount of times it says that Jesus had to die for that. The cost of unity. And how we need to die to ourself. How we need to die to the things that we would, like selfishness or pride and things like that to keep the unity that Jesus died for. One of the big takeaways I have for you is the cost of unity was the blood of Jesus Christ. And we honor his sacrifice by making every effort to keep the peace. Don't you wanna honor his sacrifice by making every effort to keep peace between us here in this church, in our circles? Hey, it's Thanksgiving this week. Woo! It's, you know how that is, right? When family comes together. <laughs> it's a perfect, perfect message, just in time. <laughs> perfect message. Galatians 3, 26 through 28. This is Paul writing to the church again. He says, for you all are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Ah, interesting. Through faith in Christ Jesus, not works, not the law. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. Like putting on new clothes, which reminds me of the armor. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, there is absolutely no room for racism. Amen. There's no room for social class division in the family of Christ. And what I mean by that is that we don't walk walk around entitled. And if and whatever class we try to label ourselves with, which we shouldn't, because Jesus doesn't. We shouldn't feel down on ourselves because of our class. Because we are family to God. Favoritism, out the window. Gender discrimination, out the window. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Gender discrimination. Jesus went to more women in the beginning of his ministry than anyone else. And he was preaching to the Samaritan woman at the well, which was totally against what they thought was okay. It made the disciples so uncomfortable. And she goes and preaches the gospel to people and tells them, come come meet this guy I met. Mary and all the Marys and Martha, they were at the tomb. The first people Jesus showed up to after the tomb. Jesus, Jesus used women disciples and apostles. If you want to read, it's in it's in Romans. We can read them. We can read their names. One of them is Junius. It was a woman. God uses anyone because that entire class or, or the entire um, division and, and everything was brought together in unity through Jesus Christ. I mean, he says it right here, Galatians 3. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise God. I have a really hard time thinking that God walks around and goes, okay, who's the man that I can use to build this church? He's looking for a willing heart to build the church. 
We wouldn't even be here without Edna Gooden's kitchen and her heart to change over Delaware. Our church was started by a woman in a Bible study. Praise Jesus for women. Praise God. I get a little hype on that. The cost of unity was the blood of Jesus Christ. We honor his sacrifice by making every effort to keep the peace that he started and that he was trying to bring into this world. That's why it's a weapon. Unity is a weapon because the devil can't stand against God's church when it's unified in one. Amen. You know how effective we're going to be working together? Man. So how do we do that? I'm going to close with these scriptures and a final thought. How do we keep peace and unity? We're in Ephesians 4. Verse 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. There's that integrity. Just in case you're wondering what that means. Lead a life worthy of the calling or the standard of God, because he called you to serve. He called you. He brought you into the family of God through faith. So be holy, because God is holy. When you, when you do digging in that scripture, that's what that means. Verse 2, always be humble and gentle. There's a humility again. You cannot mention unity without humility. You really can't. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making the allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Wow. Make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. When I looked that up, it meant to pretty much put up with people's flaws. Now, not to the sense of to the fault where you tolerate people's flaws. Okay? Like, we do have to, you know, work together to grow, right? Pride says don't grow. Humility says grow. Okay? But what it's saying is, is you're putting a church together. You're, you're bringing Gentiles and Jews together. There's going to be some things you have to put up with until the, everyone grows. Right. You, when, you, when you put a new believer in a church with seasoned believers who have been following Jesus for 30 years, there may be some differences or some things that might, you know, look different. So you put up with that for the sake of unity in Jesus Christ, for the sake of their growth in your humility. Amen? People put up with me all the time. Thank you, God. <laughs> I'm putting up with your long sermon, Ryan. That's what I'm putting up with. No, I'm sorry. Make every effort, verse 3, to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Wow. We're, we're in the body of Christ. Look, look what's coming next. Binding yourselves together with peace. That's the bond that, that Satan can't destroy. He can't compete against the bond of peace between the church. He will come against our peace. He will try to stir issues between all of us in this room and those who aren't here today and other churches. He's going to try to disturb that peace. That's what the devil wants to do. But we make every effort to not let that happen. This is spiritual warfare, church. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. Now, granted, some churches actually do not come under those things. And so we might have some conflict with teaching and doctrine. But for the most part, the primary or the majority of Christians should come under that understanding of Scripture right there. <laughs> Philippians 2. We're going to go over there. That's Paul again, right into the church. So we see that we have to work at keeping peace, making every effort, love each other, humility. Actually, humility and selfishness play a major role here in this Scripture. Verse, uh, verse 1 of Philippians 2. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Now that's not easy, is it? So what do we have to do to do that? Verse 3. 
Don't be selfish. I mean, man, God is good. He gives us the prescription of what we need to do. Don't be selfish. Sometimes our selfish ambitions, as we saw in, in James 3, the enemies behind all that, our selfish ambitions get in the way of the church working together. Instead of looking at the one Jesus Christ and what he wants to do through all of us working together. It says, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. The devil can't compete against a serving, sacrificial, selfless church. He can't win against that. So we have to work hard to be that kind of church. We got to put our preferences aside. And look at what Jesus is wanting us to do. We got to put our little issues aside that we have with others. Oh, man, we had, this was, this was so cool. I, I got a text message from a brother in Christ who had a problem with me. It was cool. Because you know what he did? He came to me about it. And I just kind of chuckled because I was like, yep, this is the enemy. Because the person who texted me, this guy has no problems with anyone. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I gave him a call. And within one minute, we're laughing together. Because we were like, that was silly, wasn't it? Yep. It was something over so, something so tiny. But the devil's really good at magnifying little things and working in your heart to go, yeah, yeah Ryan, Ryan ignored you on purpose, brother. Ryan ignored you on purpose. He ignored you on purpose. Believe that. That's what it was. And when we talked, man, it was like, it was like there never, nothing ever happened. And I said, brother, you did the right thing to not let this just fester and come right to the source. Man, I, it was something so simple. I was just, my mind was on something else, getting ready to preach, and I just completely missed him. That was it. But he was going through a lot that week. And the enemy was just compounding more and more offenses, or at least he thought, against him. And he, he gave me permission to share this, but I'm not telling you who he is. But he was like, yeah, brother, use it, man. Use it. And listen, in one minute of transparency, one minute in love and forgiveness and forbearance, putting up each other's faults, we restored our friendship. That wasn't even done. It wasn't even destroyed. It was there. <laughs> Amen. I had, a, I had a, a, someone here at the church came to me this week and said, Ryan, I got to go to this person in my family and make things right. I said, sister, go for it. Go for it. That's exactly what the devil doesn't want you to do, so go do it. Go do it. I, I'm praying for you right now. God, be with her. They talked, and on the way, by the way, she's shaking, scared. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm scared, God. I hope this works out. She went to the home, they talked, and everything's working out. Praise God for that. Praise God. That's making every effort to keep peace. Wow, that's so cool. And the last scripture is Colossians 3. This will make more sense now what I'm saying. Colossians 3, 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with a tender-hearted mercy. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Praise God. The devil can't compete against forgiveness. He lost that one on the cross. So we continue forgiveness because he can't win against it. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. That must is a command, by the way. That if you want God's forgiveness, we must learn to forgive. We need to forgive. And then we, here's what we do. We learn this at the marriage retreat. We forgive, and then we learn how to trust afterwards. Do the right thing first. I thought it was great teaching. I forgot who taught it on, at the marriage retreat. But forgive first. Have the attitude of forgiveness, and then rebuild the relationship of trust. And that is so true and so powerful.
Because I know it can be hard to forgive some big offenses that have happened. I get that. But we have to start with the attitude of forgiveness at least. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Love is the bond. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Praise God. That's our, that's our Thanksgiving scripture. And always be thankful. That's hard to do. Always. So church, Paul has given us a weapon to use in this scripture, in these scriptures, multiple weapons. One is humility. The other one is unity. That's all I could cover. We could write books on the weapons that we have because it's the weapons of righteousness. It's the weapons of Jesus. It's who Jesus is. And Paul says something really important in 2 Corinthians 6, 7. I'm going back to it. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. Right living, Christ-like character is what we use to fight against the enemy and to take ground and reach people for the kingdom of God. In closing, this is why I wanted to preach this sermon for this, pretty much this line. I've been saying it, and it's really simple. The devil can't compete against grace. He can't compete against humility or light or transparency. He can't compete against unity. It's the very thing we need to work hard at keeping in our church, in our personal lives, in our homes, in our families, behind all the division and discord is selfish ambition, is demonic influence. Church, don't choose that side. It's not wisdom from above, the word says in James 3. It's wisdom from this earth, which is not, well, it's not wise. He didn't mean to call it wisdom in that way. It's foolishness. Let's not be fools and follow the traps of the enemy or, or get, let the devil get a foothold and what a great time of the year to practice peace and unity, to make things right with our family members. And church, I'm praying for you. If that's something you need to do, praying with you. In fact, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now. God, we stand, or well, we sit here stronger knowing the truth today. Knowing your word knowing that righteousness is a weapon of attack and defense. So God, we choose to live like Jesus in this holiday season. We choose to live like Jesus every day so that we can reach the lost who are far from you. God, we choose to share the message of reconciliation that Jesus died so that all mankind can come and be made new and be a child of God. Thank you for doing that for us. Thank you for forgiving us. So help us to forgive others. God, we do our best. We make every effort to keep the peace, to honor your sacrifice, the cost of unity. The cost was your life. So we give our lives to honor you and serve you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for loving us that way. Help us to love each other the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.